Hi everybody! The original audio and video file for this lecture had some errors, so I am re-recording this after the fact. I apologize that you won't get to hear any of the student interactions, and I also apologize that this will probably not match your uh, lecture notes perfectly. However, I, in prepping for the exam, this is probably better than nothing. At this point in the semester, we're talking about um, introducing ourselves to T cell responses. So we've previously talked about B cells, the way that they can respond to antigen and potentially make antibodies. And we're starting to look at the parallel process for T cells. T cells, um, of course, have a unique receptor, the T cell receptor. Um, just like B cells have a unique receptor, the B cell receptor. Scientists did a somewhat ingenious experiment in order to actually discover the genes that encode the T cell receptor. First, they realized that the T cell receptor, as a um, transmembrane protein, would be uh, translated in a membrane-bound ribosome um, that was part of the rough ER. So first, the researchers took mRNAs uh, from a T-cell line and they separated out mRNAs being translated in the cytoplasm and mRNAs being translated at the membrane in the rough ER. Only 3% of the RNAs were being translated in the rough ER, so that narrowed down the RNAs quite a bit. They then labeled that 3% of the T cell RNAs that they had. These scientists reasoned that the T cell receptor would be transcribed in T cells, surprise, surprise. Um, however, it would not be transcribed in B cells. That means that there would be an mRNA matching this receptor in T cells, but such an mRNA would not exist in B cells because the gene was not translated. Or sorry, excuse me, transcribed. Um, as a result, uh, these researchers took their labeled um, mRNAs from the T cell. They actually made a cDNA copy of them and they mix them with mRNAs from their B cells. cDNA, of course, is complementary DNA. It is the complement of mRNA. And so if there was a cDNA um, that came from an mRNA in the T cells um, that was also represented as an mRNA in the B cells, the cDNA from the T cell, the mRNA from the B cell would hybridize. Um, if there were any mRNAs that were only made in the T cells, those cDNAs would have no partner. They would not hybridize. Um, if there were some that were in the B cells only, uh, they would again have no partner. They would not hybridize. They then got rid of all of the hybrid um, cDNA and mRNA, which were genes that are transcribed in both T cells and B cells, and they found which labeled mRNAs remained. Those were the mRNAs that had been transcribed in T cells but not in B cells and they had also of course done that selection for membrane bound um, transcripts and so they had really narrowed down uh, their transcripts to some potential T cell receptor uh, transcripts. They then um, did experiments similar to the Tonegawa experiments that we talked about earlier when we talked about discovering the B-cell receptor to determine which of those um, seemed to uh, be undergoing some type of rearrangement. And this allowed them to find the genes encoding the T-cell receptor. You'll want to remember that the T-cell receptor does not recognize antigen from a microbe by itself. Instead, that T cell receptor recognizes antigen that is being presented by an MHC molecule. The T cell receptor sees both the MHC molecule and the antigen, um, the antigenic peptide, 
And so we see this phenomenon of MHC restriction in T cells and T cell receptor recognition. Um, the T cell receptor must recognize the correct MHC and the correct antigen as shown on the left here. If the antigen is incorrect, which is shown on the far right, or if the MHC is incorrect, as shown in the middle, our T cell receptor will not recognize and will not uh, lead to a T cell response. When we look at the structure of the T cell receptor, this is what we see. The T cell receptor has two chains. One is called a heavy chain, one is called a light chain, and we'll talk more about that later, although the two are rather similar in size. Both have a transmembrane domain and both are made of immunoglobulin domains. You can see them here listed as the alpha chain and the beta chain. Um, in the end, that T cell receptor looks an awful lot like an FAB portion um, of the immunoglobulin or of the B cell receptor um, with its own transmembrane domain instead of having a constant region and things like that. Um, one thing that is important to know about the T cell receptor is that the T cell receptor has relatively low affinity compared to many other types of protein-protein interactions that we see in biology. So you can see here that the T cell receptors binding to its antigen and MHC is quite weak compared to things like adhesion molecules, growth factor receptors, or antibodies. As a result, when we think about T cell interactions with an antigen presenting cell, we often need that T cell receptor to interact with its ligand MHC plus peptide, while there are also some partner proteins interacting between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. One of the reasons for this is that this will increase the strength of binding between the two cells and make up for the fact that that T cell receptor affinity is so low. Here you can see a couple of examples of such proteins and we are going to talk more about all of these proteins in the next few lectures. Um, some of them work alongside the T cell receptor to transduce a primary signal, something that we are eventually going to call signal one um, in thinking about T cell biology. These include things like CD3 and CD4 that are shown on this slide. And these are known as part of the T cell co-receptor. There are also other proteins that are involved in important signaling processes, but those signals are sort of additive to the T cell receptor signal. You can think about them as ways that you might um, alter or spice up the T cell receptor signal, and we refer to them as co-stimulators. The co-stimulators on this slide are CD28, um, which is binding to either CD80 or 86. And we're going to go into more details about all of these proteins moving forward. Um, in reality, the proteins I showed you on the previous slide are really a minority of all of the proteins on the surface of a T cell and their interacting partners on an antigen presenting cell. Um, and so we will see a larger array of protein-protein interactions that are actually happening between our T cell and our antigen presenting cell. Um, if you look at the T cell receptor, you might notice that it has a problem. And that problem is very similar to the problem that we saw when thinking about the B cell receptor. We noted that the B cell receptor is very good as a receptor. It's quite specific. It has undergone this nice special VDJ recombination process. Um, however, it does not work too well in that it has almost no cytoplasmic domain to allow signaling to happen, and it has no enzymatic function like a kinase in order to propagate signaling. If we look at the T cell receptor, we see similar types of problems. With the B cell receptor, one of the ways this problem was solved is that the B cell receptor had two partner proteins, Ig alpha and Ig beta, 
also known as CD79A and CD79B. These proteins had cytoplasmic tails um, that had regions to be phosphorylated to allow for signaling. The T cell receptor works in a similar way. The T cell receptor also um, has some partner proteins that help in signaling, that sort of help that T cell receptor you know, get by with the help from its friends. Um, these proteins are known as the CD3 proteins. Um, there is a CD3 delta protein, a CD3 epsilon protein, a CD3 gamma protein, and a CD3 zeta protein. Um, CD3 is found along with the T cell receptor in two, or in, sorry, in three dimers. One is an alpha, excuse me, one is an epsilon delta dimer, one is a gamma epsilon dimer, and one is a zeta zeta dimer. You can see that epsilon, delta, and gamma have some extracellular domains. They have a transmembrane domain and then they have a cytoplasmic domain. While zeta has relatively little extracellular domain, it's mostly transmembrane domain and intracellular domain. All of these CD3 proteins contain a specific region in their uh, cytoplasmic surface known as an ITAM. An ITAM stands for immunotyrosine-based activation motif. These are regions that have tyrosines, um, which are amino acids that can be phosphorylated to allow signaling to happen. They are depicted as yellow rectangles in the upper right-hand slide. You can see that epsilon, delta, and gamma each have one ITAM, whereas zeta has multiple three ITAMs, as shown here. One other problem that you could imagine the T cell receptor having is that when we think about receptors, we know that they diffuse throughout the cell membrane because this, the lipids in the phospholipid bilayer are moving around the membrane. So the receptors are usually um, sort of moving randomly around the membrane. Now the alpha and the beta chain aren't a big problem because they're held together with disulfide bonds. Oftentimes, when we think about receptors that are diffusing um, through the membrane, we might think of something like an insulin receptor, which has two identical um, arms, and they diffuse separately throughout the membrane. Um, for those of you who remember lecture, even though I am at home sitting on my couch, um, repeating this lecture, I am still doing the same arm motions that I did in class to talk about this. Um, we can see those two chains diffusing in different directions throughout the membrane. However, when their ligand comes around, the two chains will both bind to ligands and that will bring them in proximity to one another. The proximity of those extracellular domains binding to ligand will also bring the intracellular domains into proximity with one another and that will allow signaling to start. This is known as the induced proximity model of signaling. This is great for many types of receptors with the insulin receptor, but for many years people did not understand how this could work for things like the T cell receptor and CD3. T the T cell receptor we could imagine diffusing randomly around the cell surface, and we could imagine CD3 diffusing separately. Since CD3 doesn't have much of an extracellular domain, it really isn't binding to MHC plus peptide. How could CD3 ever be induced to be in proximity to the T cell receptor? They weren't ever going to both bind to the same ligand. Um, this problem was uh, solved in some work done by someone named Matt Call, uh, who was um, in my graduate program uh, a few years ahead of me, so I always love to see this in a textbook since I remember the person who was doing the experiments when he was doing them. Um, it was shown that in the transmembrane domains of both the T cell receptor and the CD3 proteins, there are charged amino acids. This is rare for a transmembrane domain as we tend to have things that are usually going to be uncharged going through the lipid part 
of the plasma membrane. However, there are these charged amino acids in CD3 and the T-cell receptor, and CD3 and the T-cell receptor are actually attracted to one another by these opposing charges um, that are opposite in charge and also are at the right levels for the CD3 and the T-cell receptor in terms of height within the membrane um, to allow for interactions. And so at the bottom, you can see the charges on delta and epsilon interacting with alpha, other charges in gamma and epsilon interacting with beta, and the charges in zeta interacting with alpha as well. And as a result, this entire receptor complex will diffuse together throughout the membrane and won't actually be separate and need to be induced into proximity. This was first shown for CD3 and the T-cell receptor, but similar things have since been shown for um, IgA and IgBeta with the B-cell receptor and for other types of receptors in the immune system. Um, if you recall, CD3 solves one part of our problem that we see with uh, the T-cell receptor. This solves that same problem that Ig alpha and Ig beta solve in that they give the T-cell receptor an intracellular domain that contains a tyrosine in the ITAM that can be phosphorylated. We still are missing enzymatic machinery, however. In the case of B cells, I just told you there's a kinase, and we'll learn a little bit more about those kinases later. Um, in the case of T cells, I can tell you a little bit more about the kinase now. So we have already talked a little bit about co-receptor proteins CD4 and CD8. On a helper T cell or CD4 positive T cell, the cell has CD4. And that CD4 binds to the MHC class 2 molecule at a conserved portion, sort of behind the peptide binding groove, um, while CD8 binds to a conserved portion of MHC class 1 on a cytotoxic or CD8 positive T cell. One reason why this is important is it helps the affinity of the T cell um, receptor for its antigen MHC plus peptide. However, when that C4, for example, shown here, um, is brought into proximity of the MHC molecule, in this case it's CD4 binding to MHC class 2, you can see that it is it's intracellular region is also brought in proximity to the T-cell receptor and CD3. On the left-hand part of this slide, CD4 is supposed to be far from the T-cell receptor, and on the right-hand part, it is supposed to be closer. Um, CD4 interacts with a kinase known as LCK. CD8 also interacts with a kinase. Um, it's in the same family as LCK. Technically, it is called fin um, they're both part of the SARC family of kinases. Um, if you said that CD8 responded or worked with LCK, that'd be okay. Um, and so as a result, when CD4 comes and binds MHC class 2, it brings LCK close to the T-cell receptor, um, allowing LCK to phosphorylate the ITAMs. And you can see that here being shown as pink dots being added to the yellow parts of the CD3 molecule. So the co-receptor CD4 or CD8, depending on if it's a CD4 T cell or a CD8 T cell, is both stabilizing the interaction between the T cell receptor and MHC and also participating in the signaling by bringing a kinase that can start the signaling process. These details will become important as we talk about the T cell receptor um, development in terms of rearrangement and how T cells differentiate because T cells will need CD4, CD8, CD3 in order to get a signal during their T cell development process. That's why I have to tell you about this part of signaling right now. There is one type of um, exception to everything that we talked about. Some Microbes, some microbial pathogens, make molecules that are known as superantigens. Superantigens are proteins um, that are able to bind to some sort of TCR beta chain as well as to an MHC molecule 
and force the two to be bound together. They hold them with a very tight affinity together. And they do this whether or not the T cell receptor matches with the MHC and or peptide um, there. It's just sort of randomly pairing T cells that have a specific V beta region with an antigen matching cell. This eventually leads to a very strong signal for the T cell. The T cell sort of goes haywire with its cytokine production. Um, and this causes a lot of pathology. Sometimes people ask, why is it beneficial for a microbe to um, turn on a T cell response? Um, and in this case, we are turning on such a robust and dramatic T cell response that responding to the microbe sort of gets lost in the shuffle. Um, there are some cases where a super antigen can bind to up to 20% of all T cells. Um, super antigens are a huge problem um, and can be the cause of multiple different types of diseases. Um, and so this is a set of examples of some of the super antigens that exist. Many of the toxins that we see coming from staphylococcal organisms that result in food poisoning um, are super antigens. Another particularly famous super antigen is toxic shock syndrome toxin, um, the, which is the cause of toxic shock syndrome um, in bacteria, bacterial infection uh, and disease too. Um, all of which bind to some type of variable region, ECC listed here, um, that can lead to uh, signaling, um, very strong signals in our T cell and potentially problems with our T cells. So this is one exception to um, turning on a T cell through the normal ways that I have previously been telling you about. Um, you do not have to have a super antigen um, present in your body. Um, but if we think about the more normal standard biology of the T cell receptor, we start to see a lot of things that look rather familiar compared to the B cell receptor. So our T cell receptor, as I previously mentioned, has two chains, an alpha chain and a beta chain, both of which contain two immunoglobulin domains, one of which is a variable region, one of which is a constant region. The two chains are held together by a disulfide bond. They're commonly within study chains alpha and beta, although as you'll see uh, later on, not always the case. As the variable regions are made of immunoglobulin domains, they each have those same three groups coming off of their immunoglobulin domain um, that can make contact with the antigen, which in this case is MHC plus peptide. And those three groups will be our CDR regions. Um, for a little while, immunologists were really worried about the T-cell receptor. And they were really worried because they wondered whether the T-cell receptor was formed by a different process of uh, diversity than we saw with the B-cell receptor. They thought, oh no, I don't want to have to learn two processes after I've already learned this complicated VEJ recombination. Happily, they eventually determined that the T-cell receptor was also formed by VDJ recombination. We have one chain here shown as the beta chain on the bottom that contains a V, D, and a J segment as well as a constant region and is a heavy chain. And you can see that V, D, and J come together to make the variable region of beta. And our 
alpha chain, which is our light chain here, has a V and a J that come together through VJ recombination um, to make the variable region of alpha um, and come together with the constant region uh, encoding region of the alpha chain, making us the T-cell receptor protein that we see. Um, the CDRs are also encoded very similarly to the CDRs that we see in the B-cell receptor. So in the case of the T-cell receptor, CDRs 1 and 2 are encoded as part of the variable chain, either of the alpha or the beta. So whichever CDR uh, variable region is picked, that dictates which CDR1 and CDR2 um, is picked by the T-cell. The CDR3 is encoded by the junction between the V, D, and J segments. So that's the one that has the most variation, um, or the V and J in the case of the light chain. Um, and that's the one that's made new by the process of VDJ recombination. Um, here you can see uh, the alpha and the beta loci from mice. This is a simplified view and we'll see um, a more complex view later. Um, so you can see that the alpha chain has multiple variable regions and multiple or V regions, multiple J regions and the constant region for the alpha chain. Um, and you can see that Beta looks a little different. It has two regions of deltas, two regions, or sorry, of Ds, two regions of Js, and um, some Vs, as well as two constant regions. Um, but you can see that beta looks like a heavy chain and alpha looks like a light chain. The place where things look a bit different in T cells is when we add on the RSSs onto our gene segments. You can see that in the alpha. Um, gene segments, we have a 23 base pair RSS on the Vs and a 12 base pair RSS on the Js. And so we can see VJ recombination happening easily. That one's not particularly surprising. If you look at beta, however, we see something different than we saw in the heavy chain for the B cells. You can see that on the D segment, we have two different kinds of RSSs. Um, We've got a 12 base pair on one side, a 23 base pair on the other side. And you can see that the V and the J have different RSSs. They're not the same. This could potentially lead to two problems happening in the beta rearrangement. One, the RSSs on V and on J are different from one another. And so it is possible that V could recombine with J skipping D altogether. It is also possible that two D segments that are next to one another might be able to do VDJ recombination with, or sorry, to do recombination, and so we might end up with VDDJ um, and have multiple D segments. V to J rearrangement is not observed in T cells. We don't exactly know why because the 1223 rule theoretically should allow it to happen. However, we do see DD fusions where more than one D segment is used and you can imagine that might be another way of getting additional diversity in our developing T cells. Because of the unique setup of the beta uh, locus where we have two beta constant regions and two sets of D and J segments. Um, each beta locus can attempt rearrangement twice um, in order to make a beta chain. And so this allows our T cell to have more attempts at making productive rearrangements. Notice that everything I'm telling you about rearrangement today has to do with making a productive rearrangement, making an in-frame protein that is a complete protein. We are not seeing any changes made or trying again to do recombination due to self-reactivity. Um, that process of receptor editing that we saw in B cells does not happen in T cells. We'll get more into that when we talk about T cell development, but this attempt to recombine more than once is solely in order to make a functional protein. Um, with alpha, the cell is going to be able to try many times to make a productive rearrangement. 
So if an internal V and an internal J are used, we can have more rearrangements that happen in order to produce a functional alpha chain. Um, in total, all of these things, the V, D, and J segments, the P and N nucleotides, exactly what we talked about before, um, the pairing of heavy chains and light chains, etc., gives us the dramatic T cell diversity that we see in the same way that these types of processes led to um, B cell diversity that we saw before. Um, and so you can see um, a comparison between B cells and T cells um, here. You'll see that both use multiple VDJ genes um, or VDJ recombination. Both pair uh, light chains and heavy chains. Both use Reg1 and Reg2. Both have P and N nucleotides. You can see that T cells can have um, multiple D regions that are joined. Um, at the bottom, you can see that um, T cells do not undergo somatic hypermutation. They do not have isotype switching. The constant region type has nothing to do with function. Um, and there is no secreted product. One thing that I forgot to mention before that is a little bit tricky with T cells is that TCR alpha is rather terrible at allelic exclusion. And so allelic exclusion is not complete at TCR alpha. There are a fair number of T cells that may express more than one alpha locus. Um, and so this may be a little bit of a problem. You can also see that described here where it says that in T cells, allelic exclusion of TCR alpha genes is not absolute. Um, so now that we've th thought about uh, the um, T cell receptor a little bit, we can begin to think a little bit more about T cell responses and um, aspects of uh, T cell biology. Unfortunately, there is one detail in all of this that I have left out. Um, so here you see the T cell receptor um, labeled as having the two chains, the alpha chain and the beta chain. We see T cells being either CD4s or CD8s and some of the types of sort of T cell responses that are shown here. All of this refers to sort of a rather classic type of T cell. However, it turns out that there are some other types of T cells that do a little of this differently. In reality, there, we can classify T cells in many ways, and one of them is into either alpha beta T cells or gamma delta T cells. Alpha beta T cells have a T cell receptor that contains an alpha chain which is the light chain and a beta chain, whereas gamma deltas have a gamma chain and a delta chain. Um, they are both rather structurally similar in terms of having variable regions and constant regions, being made of immunoglobulin domains, having CDRs, being held together by uh, disulfide bonds, having very little cytoplasmic region, all of that. Um, and there are a couple of other details that we have to think about with regard to the gamma and delta chains that are particularly important when we think about BDJ in T cells. Um, here you can see the same information I showed you before about alpha and beta. You can see that beta is a heavy chain that has a V, D, and a J, and alpha is a light chain that has just a V and a J. You can also see that gamma is a light chain, it has a V and a J, while delta is a heavy chain, it has a V, D, and a J. And you can see that delta has the same weird RSS configuration as beta, um, so that weird configuration is general to all T cells, not just to the beta chain. Um, here we can start to see something that is particularly uh, unique when we think about the T cell receptor um, loci. What you should notice is that um, in both human and in mouse, the alpha chain and the delta chain are encoded in the same locus. Yes, it is true that in humans, beta and gamma are on the same chromosome as well, um, but we can ignore that. Really what we care here is that in both human and in mice, the alpha chain and the delta chain are on the same chromosome. That might not be a problem, not a problem for beta and gamma in human, but it turns out that there is an additional complication that comes up because of this chromosomal location. It's not just that they are on the same chromosome, 
Um, in fact, they're in the same location. And so here you can see an actual version of the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta loci in the mouse. You can see the gamma chain looks sort of like a normal light chain locus. You can see the beta chain looks as we've described it before. But what you should notice is that the delta locus, the V delta, the D delta, the J delta, and the C delta are all in the middle of the alpha locus between V alpha and J alpha. What that means is that if we were to do rearrangement of the alpha chain, uh, putting a V alpha with a J alpha, we would end up deleting all of the delta locus. And so there ends up being a choice that the cell will make in terms of its rearrangement of V alphas versus the deltas. You can see that here as well. When our cell rearranges V alpha and J alpha, um, that can lead to deletion of the entire delta chain because delta is in the middle of the alpha locus. This makes VDJ and the choice between the alpha beta T cell and the gamma delta T cell a little bit more complicated. Um, here we can see some of the details of T cell development. We can see that our T cells are developing from a first the hematopoietic stem cell and then the common lymphoid progenitor, which can make either T cells or B cells. And we can see that there are a number of different subtypes of T cells, each of which have its own type of function. The T cells are going to do this developmental process in the thymus. So the hematopoietic stem cell is found in the bone marrow, as is the common lymphoid progenitor. If that cell decides to develop into a B cell, it will remain in the bone marrow and do B cell development there. However, if that cell decides to become a T cell, it will migrate to the thymus, which is an organ that's sitting on top of the heart and that you saw in our mouse lab. Um, it's different than the thyroid, which is also shown here and people often confuse them. And our T cells will then do T cell development and all of their selection processes that allow for central tolerance in the thymus. Sometimes we think of the thymus as sort of like, you know, T cell college, where the T cells have to go away and get educated. And it is often talked about as T cell education. Um, different parts of the T cell development process all happen within the thymus. So that cell comes in as sort of a ready to develop T cell into the thymus, and then will move into different locations in the thymus um, to do different stages of its development. So you can see that there's a region called the cortex and a region called the medulla um, where different parts of T cell development happen. Those regions are easily distinguishable under a microscope. So you can see the medulla and the cortex shown here. I really like this image of the medulla and the cortex um, because when I first learned them, I kind of thought of them as two concentric circles. And here you can see that there are actually regions of medulla and regions of cortex spread throughout the thymus. Um, and so our T cell is going to undergo um, its T cell development in the thymus. On the left hand side, you can notice um, that um, there are a whole or sorry, on the right-hand side, you can see our developing T cell, which is sort of the big blue cell with letters in it. Um, and you can see that it is among a huge number of other cells in the thymus. Those are the stromal cells, um, just like we saw stromal cells in the bone marrow um, that are going to support the development of our developing T cells. And interactions between the developing T cells and all of those cells in the thymus are critical for aspects of T cell development. Um, I mentioned before that sometimes when we see heart surgery, um, the thymus gets cut off and you all were horrified. Um, but there is a little bit of science behind what is going on there. So it has been noted that the thymus um, changes the amount of T cells that are outputted um, over time as an individual ages. 
on the left hand side is sort of a view of this where you can see that a lot of T cells are made when an individual is quite young and even by age two there's a little bit of a drop off and you can see that there's an additional drop off over time where the thymus stops outputting T cells. It was originally thought that this was a bit more dramatic earlier on and there is this idea that the thymus stops working as you age or that the thymus is really only important in kids. This is partially important because when we did our mouse lab I had to pick mice that were young enough that they would still have um, a good uh, thymus. That thymus at the beginning looks something like what you see in the middle. However, as one ages, um, it starts to look more like what you see on the right hand side. This is called thymic involution and really what happens is that we have fat cells invading the thymus, um, getting rid of some of the um, sort of thymic structure cells which are really important for our developing T cells to interact with as those T cells develop. And so there's less space available for those developing T cells to develop, less interacting cells for those developing T cells to help their development. And the thymus is even harder to find and is quite delicate when you're doing your um, dissections if you start to look at an older thymus. So this process is thymic involution. Um, so this is why many people sort of think that it might be okay to get rid of the thymus um, over time because it is thought to not do anything as an individual ages, in some cases even past uh, two years old. We know that now it's a bit more active than we originally thought over long periods of time, but it does uh, reduce a bit in its output. Um, there are also um, some mice that have been found um, that don't have a thymus. This is a natural mutation that was observed. Um, and these mice are known as nude mice. They have no thymus. Um, it turns out that we now understand the genetic defect that's been found in nude mice. Um, it's actually a step of development that does not happen. And nude mice also, as you can see here, do not have hair. Um, the lack of hair and the lack of a thymus are totally unrelated to one another. Um, so don't think that the thymus controls hair development. Um, but nude mice are very commonly used um, in the field of immunology to study aspects of thymic development. We can give them thymus transplants, which will allow them to have normal T cell development. Whereas if they are just sort of the standard nude mouse, they will have no T cells because they have no thymus to allow for T cell development. There is also a human uh, mutation or a human condition called de George's syndrome where patients are born without a functional thymus. As a result, those patients don't have any active T cells. Um, those patients have hair. There's nothing to do with the hair thing there. Um, and those patients are frequently uh, cured with a thymus transplant. It turns out that the thymus doesn't even have to be in the anatomic location where we see it. Often in DeGeorge's patients, the thymus is transplanted into the quadricep muscle. Um, with the nude mice, you typically put it in the kidney capsule, um, and T cell development is perfectly uh, able to happen in those cases. Um, sometimes you will see nude mice in some pretty weird looking um, pictures online. This has to do with the fact that as these mice lack T cells, they are um, able to support some different kinds of transplants. If you see some sort of weird images, we can talk about sort of what the relevance of those experiments are because there are a few pretty famous ones out there. Um, and so we can take our nude mouse that has a thymic defect and we can perform a transplant of a thymus into that mouse. So here you can see our nude mouse um, is a uh, yellow mouse. You can see that we can give it a thymus. It turns out that it's a green thymus here, which we'll care about later. Um, and then we're going to have normal repopulation. This, cell, this mouse is going to have T-cell development. Um, many of the other types of immunodeficiencies that we have talked about or that we can think about um, have to do with some type of defect that is intrinsic to the developing cells themselves. Maybe they don't have RAG, maybe they don't have the IL-7 receptor, maybe they don't have something like that. Those mice will have a defect in lymphocytes. They still won't have T cells, but it's not because their thymus doesn't work, it's because they have cells that can't develop. Those cells, can, those mice 
um, and in fact, people with those types of immunodeficiencies can all be treated with a bone marrow transplant where we put in uh, bone marrow cells, the cells will um, now develop in the thymus that was there and that was just fine. Um, one thing that I should mention is that if we were to do uh, radiation therapy on a mouse, this would, or on a person, this would kill all of the rapidly dividing cells, which includes all of the immune cells and the developing immune cells, but it would not kill all the structural cells of the thymus. So that thymus would still be ready to go to re educate new T cells if we were to transplant in new bone marrow cells. And also notice here that we have a green mouse with a green thymus and we happen to give it yellow bone marrow. Um, both of these are major treatments for different types of diseases which are primary immunodeficiency diseases where someone is born with a genetic defect that leads to a lack of some um, immune system. Um, most of these people are uh, diagnosed as small children when they're getting recurrent infections. Um, and you can see that this is sometimes described when we see someone with four or more ear infections within a year, two or more serious sinus infections, two or more months on antibiotic with no effects, pneumonia within a year, um, a lot of problems as a, as a baby. Um, that primary immunodeficiency can be diagnosed and generally treated either with bone marrow transplantation or if it's a DeGeorge syndrome situation with a thymus transplant. However, there's one critical thing that we need to understand about this process. When T cells undergo T cell development, those T cells are restricted by the MHC type of the thymus that they are put in. This is because those structural cells, those stromal cells in the thymus, are so important for supporting the development of T cells, they actually kind of teach the T cell what is self. Here you can see that we can take bone marrow from an orange mouse and we can put it into either an irradiated MHCA yellow mouse or an irradiated blue mouse. The yellow mouse has a yellow thymus. The blue mouse has a blue thymus. Even though all of this bone marrow started out in an orange mouse and thinking orange is self, um, after developing in a yellow mouse with a yellow thymus, the resulting T cells will think that yellow is self. You put that same orange bone marrow into a blue mouse and those T cells that develop will grow up thinking that blue is self. If we look back at this situation where we put in green, um, we put a green thymus in a yellow mouse, um, in the end, the, these cells that develop are going to think that green is self, which might be a problem for this mouse. Here we can put yellow um, stem cells into a green mouse. Again, these cells are going to grow up thinking green is self um, because uh, that is the type of the thymus. Um, so here you see the same thing, those same cells. Um, and so Oftentimes, people have been able to understand T-cell development and MHC restriction by doing different types of um, experiments where they alter the genetic types of the MHC of the thymus versus of the bone marrow or the rest of the mouse. So here you can see a mouse on the left that is uh, an F1 of type A and type B. So it has one of all of its chromosomes are type A from its one parent, one is type B from the other parent, including MHC. We can infect that mouse with a virus, LCMV, and we'll find that there are some cells that can kill uh, strain A um, restricted targets, some that can kill strain B restricted targets. If you take the same mouse and do a thymectomy, so you remove its thymus and then do a radiation, so you kind of erased the whole immune system of this mouse. And then give this mouse a thymus transplant where that thymus is only uh, strain B and give back that same uh, bone marrow. If we look at the resulting cells, you'll see that all of the T cells that we find kill strain B and none of them kill strain A. And that's because all of those cells grew up in the strain B thymus um, and are thus restricted by MHC type of strain A, or excuse me, of strain B. Um, and so this can, like I said, be used for uh, understanding a number of aspects of T cell development as well as MHC biology. Um, in the next lecture, 
which I will probably record in 20 minutes or so, um, we will talk through the details of T-cell development um, in the thymus, um, going through the steps in parallel to what we saw for B-cells. So look forward to the next one.